No, I can't. Is it? Is it? Mm, I know. We'll put this on. Okay, well, I guess we are live here. It says we're live. We'll see how live we are when it's all over. Uh, we're still alive. I'm here with um, Major Paul Harrington, retired from the U.S. Army, who also happens to be my dad. And uh, we're at the, what is this? It's the U.S. Army uh, Artillery Museum. If you're looking for it on Facebook, you can go to, you can, uh, I think you can search Artillery Museum or U.S. Army Artillery Museum. And it's really a nice collection of um, everything from even Civil, well, Civil War and pre-Civil War because the diorama out front, if you go on their uh, page, you can see the diorama out front they did. It fills up a whole room, and it's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's about 1840s, I think, is what that uh, display is, and it's uh, horse artillery. Which behind us is actually a diorama of a, a M7, and of course there's a Jeep in the foreground, but uh, the M7 is the Sherman tank chassis with a 105 howitzer mounted on it. And uh, Major Harrington at the time, well actually we're here for an OCS reunion, Officers Candidate School for the Artillery School that he went through in 1943 and actually right now he's the uh the last one from world war ii that showed up the rest of the guys didn't want to come or weren't able put it that way for most but so right now the reunion is mostly vietnam veterans and um what, what we're looking at here is uh we got some questions we had from some L4 and L5 owners, L4 is the Piper Cub, and these were artillery spotter planes and liaison uh, planes that were used back in World War II, and there's some people that have them restored, and mostly those are in Europe now because they didn't come back after the end of World War II. And uh, so, let's have you say something as far as your... Um, well, how, well, let's go back to the OCS and go through that. I mean, you were here in 1943. Yeah. Okay. And then you returned here in, because I was here in 1959. 59. 62. 59 and 62. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was for advanced officer training or. Well, one of them was uh, 59 was the uh, instrument flight school, and uh, 62 was the advanced officer course. Okay, so in 1959, you took instrument flight training. Right, here. And did the uh, L4 Piper Cub, did that have instruments? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you had if you had a needle ball on there, they, you're supposed to have all you need for an instrument, needle ball, and air speed. Exactly. Yeah. So, oh, right. As long as it was That's all you had. <laughs> what was the altimeter? And the, okay, which worked most the of the conference. time, right? Unless the weather was bad or. Uh, Mostly you didn't fly if the weather was bad, but occasionally you did. Okay. You, you, occasionally you did. Yeah. And by, I don't know, what would that entail, like if you were to fly when it was, when the weather was bad? Is that just because it was windy or? No, if you had a low cloud cover, you might try to go up through it and, and uh, Navigate above the cloud, but then uh, you got to find a way down, don't you? Yeah, it's hard to find where you are. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Well, and then, so this actually, this diorama was um, uh, from December 44 in Europe. I believe you were there. Yeah, this is from the Battle of Bulls type. Right, because there's snow on everything. Yeah. So yeah. About the same time as the Bulls. Okay. And, uh, well, getting back to that situation, it was uh, the weather was um, obviously not good. That's why they planned it when they did. Yeah, well, I'm sure that that figured into it. Well, uh, yeah, that was what they were trying to do is to make that our day offensive when the U.S. Army would be grounded due to bad weather. Well, uh, we didn't fly on the we didn't fly on the 16th or the 18th, but, but Biff and I did fly on the 17th. And uh, as far as I remember, we were the only planes flying that day. At Never least saw any others anyway. Well, that's a good. Um, that's something I was. I'm curious about. You said the weather was bad. Was you couldn't see, or was snowing, or wind, mostly. Mostly wind. Yeah, the, the ground crew had to catch the plane when you come in for a landing and hold it down while they refueled it. Well, that would be kind of windy, but that was a, that's okay. So that's the all four, right? And it's not exactly overpowered. No, with <laughs> just, just barely enough to kill you. <laughs> 65 horsepower Continental. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's still, I'm still curious why we didn't, I mean, I know there was some use of the fighter bombers in other parts of the battle, but you didn't happen to see any. Not on that day. Because you would think they would have enough horsepower to take off even if it's windy. Right. Yeah, that wouldn't have been a problem, but we just didn't see anybody flying. Hmm. Um, okay. So, let's go back a little bit. You took Officer's Canada School training here. You had gone through ROTC at Purdue University, right? Right. And then... You, you got the instruction to be an officer in how long? 13, 13 weeks. 13? 90 day wonders. <laughs> 90 day wonders, huh? Mm -hmm. I noticed that the Vietnam guys, they did it about double that amount of time. Almost. Six yeah. months, I think, is, is what they were. No, they were 24 weeks, I think. 24 weeks? Okay. They probably didn't think that was long enough either. No, well, maybe not. Uh, um, okay, and then you went to Denton. This would be 1943. Right. And you went to Denton, Texas for basic flight training. Basic flight training. Um, and that was... Um, was L2s, L3s, and L4s. Okay, so those were Aronica, Taylor... Taylor Craft, and Veronica, and, um, and Piper. Piper right. And were they all about the same horsepower? Yeah, they were all the same engine. They were all the same engine. Yeah. 60, 65, 65 horsepower. Okay. Continental. Um, so they all fly about the same? Pretty much. Uh, the L4, you were supposed to, if you were flying solo, supposed to fly from the back seat, but I never did. Uh, that was because we had the radio on the back shelf, and the, and we always had a parachute strapped on the back seat for a, for a passenger. We took one. And uh huh. So, well, so you know, just as a reference here, this amazing museum we're in um, above us is actually an L4 and I don't know if you can really see the reference but um, there's only one person in the plane 
and he's in the front seat. And the pilot's flying from the front seat. So Bart, I don't know about the back seat flying. Hey, other than it would probably be less likely to have a ground loop, which I think you might have experienced at least. Or at least put the plane over. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so that's still a question whether uh, what's the easy, easiest or safest way to fly and probably if it was empty maybe the back seat would be better hard to say because i'm not a pilot <laughs> i just said i never flew one from the back seat so. that wasn't your experience then no okay you might have to speak up a little bit okay i'm probably talking too loud oh. and then we got this air conditioner back here which i think they tried to make this arden um display more real because they had the air conditioner it was down to about 50 degrees when we came in this morning <laughs> and apparently it was a little problem with the air conditioning system last night but hence the jackets when it's kind of warm outside uh all right so then so from there let's see you went back to fort so yeah for your advanced pilot training right and that was in an l4 yes that was a piper cup yeah, and how did that differ from just your your basic pilot training uh mostly just to teach you tactics on landing and uh, taking off. And I remember one instructor just chopped the engine and said, find a place to land. So they, okay. So dead stick landing. Dead stick landing and it's kind of hilly here and you just had to find a place to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And you did also did like one wheel landings and two. And what, why would you want to do a one wheel land? Crosswind? Crosswind. Yeah. Crosswinds, okay. I think you did a one wheel landing in an L1, didn't you, at one point in time after the war? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I'd knocked the other gear off. And so uh, <laughs> I had to land on one gear. How did that end up? That, I think that was. And it collapsed. Oh, that so you didn't have. So you kind of bellied out. Right. Okay. Wrap the prop around the engine and, and put it in the junk pile, probably, which is where it came from. Yeah, before it was, you flew it, it. was uh, salvaged before uh, I had it, and uh, it was certainly salvaged afterwards. <laughs> so that was one question that in a list of questions we got. Someone had asked, what did you do after the war? You were a replacement pilot for the 62nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion. During the war. During the war. And then um, through 1944 and uh, 45, and then after the war in 45, you didn't have enough points to go home yet. No. No. So you were an occupation troop. Well, neither did yeah. We had too many points to go to uh, the Pacific and not enough to go home. That's a good place to be, I guess. I mean, yes, it was. <laughs> so because if you didn't have enough points, you would then be heading to the Pacific. Right. Yeah. Because your unit actually went from North Africa. Well, they went across the Atlantic and to North Africa and then Sicily. They thought they were going to the invasion of Italy, and they went out. Uh, then they, well, then they did the invasion of Sicily. And when they left Sicily, they thought they were um, heading to Italy. Because I remember Swire saying he had uh, attached his rifle uh, inside of an M7, and that M7 left without him. And then they got on a ship and headed to. Uh, UK. Yeah, they were heading to the UK, but they went actually far, uh, 
out into the Atlantic far enough, they thought they were going home. Oh. And then they turned around because they were avoiding the U-boats and, and headed back to the UK. Um, so where were we? we were okay, so we we're talking about after the war. What did you do after the war? You were flying? Well, first uh, I was assigned flying mail from uh, Pilsen to uh, Mariansky Lozny. Uh, Say in the morning and in the afternoon to fly it down to Innsbruck, the units there. And uh, we had enough pilots that one would do this, that in the morning, the other one, another one would do the, the other, the reverse way in the morning and then the same way. So they got mail twice a day. I think you said you flew into Innsbruck and Right. It was on the side of a mountain. Right. Had the taxi full, full throttle of the taxi up the strip. And then you take off going downhill. Yeah. No matter which way the wind's no going. No matter which way the wind. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. You couldn't you couldn't try to taxi uh, to take off going no. uphill. No taxi. And then you were also ferrying planes because there's a lot of planes, a lot of these guys that have these L4s or whatever, those were all collected. We gave up, we gave up Czechoslovakia to the Russians. And then they, uh, the third army air officer, who was a friend of mine from pilot school, uh, assigned me to an air force unit that was ferrying planes from uh, the Chemsey to Frankfurt. Kempsey was a turn in place for units that were departing. And we'd bury the planes, whether they were L1s or, you know, we, whatever they were L1s, L4s, L5s. Uh, I think that's mostly it. And uh, somebody asked about how did you transition. Uh, in those days, if you could fly a plane, you could fly any plane. You didn't have like a checkout and a manual no. and no, no, no. Just jump in and well, you re read the manual. Well, that'd be good. Yeah, if there was one. Yeah, if there was one. I know on the M7, I found a 102 page, 120 page manual on how to operate this. Um, a self-propelled artillery piece and, and uh, the proper way to do it. And I asked the soldiers how they were taught and they told me they got theirs on board ship on the way to their first invasion. And they just did some dry firing exercises with it. And there was no manual gotten them. Basically they'd gotten a piece of artillery that had a 105 split trail howitzer welded to the top of a, the deck of a, the, the chassis of a well, the first of the tank were on the half track. The first one on half track, and they found out that was too top, top heavy. heavy. Yeah, and so then they put it on the on a tank chassis. Tank chassis. Yeah, and but they didn't have a manual either. No. And I asked about when they had they had this thing in the manual about li uh, live rounds when uh, or if they had a dud that they had to take it. X amount of yards away from the from the uh, artillery piece and put it in a pre-dug trench and all of these rules about how to deal with the dud and you, they <laughs> we didn't have anything like you couldn't mess with something like that no because they were actually firing rather rather rapidly in that so okay so um in fact I think during the bulge they mentioned that the barrels got so hot they had to slow down. Uh, when they were firing the artillery, which I guess you were spotting from the air, probably along with other forward observers and yeah. on the ground. Um, okay, so getting back to our, oh, we'll get back to our list of questions. So we we kind of covered what you did afterwards. Um, what was the biggest plane you flew back then? C sixty four. A C sixty four. Didn't you tell me a B seventeen? I included formation with us one day and uh, he had to drop his 
gear and put down these flaps to go as slow as we were in the C-64. And he did that for a little while, and he just waved and picked up his trash and left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, well, I'm just going to start from the top of the list. Then we'll get we'll get out, we'll go out of the back into the order of what our questions were of these um, L4 enthusiasts and uh, Piper Cub pilots, okay? Um, we have Martin B. Olsen from Denmark. He wants to know if you remember using a messenger pouch, a drop bag, was attached. I don't think we ever used that. You never trained in it or anything? No. Or, mm -hmm. And then you see them where they're kind of flying by and picking up with a, a a message no, bag no, off of books. Never, yeah, I've seen those pictures, but we never did that. Because you had radios. Right. And radios work a little better than the bags. I remember Lester Wagner, who was a signalman with the 62nd, told me that, that they were trained in, in do, using semaphore flags from the artillery pieces. And he said that was about the dumbest thing you could do is stand on top of a tank with a bunch of flags and we waving them around so they didn't use that either um did you ever fly the l4j with the beach roby prop and if so did you like it no i never flew one we always had fixed props you always had fixed props yeah now many of those fixed props did you go through a few i don't know that but you always had one with the oh, ground yeah. crew. The ground crew always had extra props and extra gear, landing gear. Uh, so that when you got one of those, uh, uh, they just replace it. Mm. And I think you had mentioned that you that you repaired one of the holes in the fuselage or the wings with the mat and yeah, some until, dope. Until they had time. No, no dope. Just tape it on the tape it on to the hole and did you have duct tape or did you have it must have had something, something like that yeah well it keeps it from ripping any further masking tape probably <laughs> that's that's safe tape. that's safe <laughs> okay no here's from isa baz from france and you know if i i didn't uh uh pronounce your name right that's because I don't know how to speak that language I think um, how was the transition done from the L4 to the L5 okay this is the other question was it proper training or did you just read a book and go but when you're learning the L5 yeah, generally like the L4 or the L5 there's very little difference except for the horse falling uh, it flies about the same way and in fact it, then the attitude was if you can fly a plane you can fly any of them because they're it's all basically the they're same all tail draggers and they're all <laughs> they're all they all have a rudder and and ailerons and that and so uh, what's the difference horsepower yeah I guess, and, and, and well, you and know, portable pitch props and, and things like that. But the general attitude was if you can fly a plane, you can fly any of them. Okay, so if you, and that's, that's the same way with me flying that C64, uh, you know, you've got rudders and a stick. But it's a little bit bigger plane. A little bit, you got a round engine. That was a, if I remember right, that was a 440 horse. And, well, be, and a controllable pitch prop. Mm -hmm. And it would haul 11 people or 10, 10 or 11 people and 350 liter barrels of beer that we'd always stop at Augsburg. And because that was the, the pickup plane, we'd ferry the plane to. Uh, Okay. Frankfurt, 
And then the C-64 would pick us up and fly us back to the Chem Sea. But we'd always stop at Augsburg and pick up three 50-liter barrels of beer so that we'd have plenty to drink. When we yeah, back. you never know when you're grounded for a while. Well, that's right. Sometimes you can... Uh, one time we flew over there and we were grounded, because, or the C-64 was grounded, and so we took a leave train to Augsburg and uh, some Red Cross girls had a Mercedes there and, and we went with them down to, to uh, the Duke pits mm -hmm. and we stayed there a couple of days and then got somebody to, to drive us back in the Jeep and, and uh, to the, to the Chemsey and they hadn't flown a day since we left. <laughs> so you didn't miss any work? No, we didn't miss any work at no. all. <laughs> and enjoyed the, uh, the Duke Pit for a couple of days. Okay, so he was at, uh, then he, uh, other, his other question is, what is the co comparative feeling between those two planes? Which one did you prefer? And, well, you always uh, preferred the one with more horsepower. Now I'm talking about the L4 and the L5. Oh, no, that's it. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. I preferred the L5. went from a 65 to 185, oh, if I remember right. Yeah. And the horsepower of the L5, I think it's 185. But it didn't quite have the same short field ability, um, or did it? Almost. With that extra horsepower, I could almost uh, get off and about the same. But I don't know that any of the artillery units had L5s as organic. No, those planes. were usually in the Corps or uh, Army headquarters. Mm -hmm. They weren't down into the battalions like we were. Maybe just they, because they came off an airstrip rather than a grass well, there, field? or There weren't that many of them there, and so, okay. uh, you know, Army gets first choice, and then and it trickles down to you guys at the end. Right. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, sir. Hi. I, are you a veteran of World War II? Yes, sir. We are French. Huh? We are French. Oh. <laughs> Have you been in France? Yes, sir. Where? Yeah. Where? Well, uh, I came in on Omaha Beach and uh, as a replacement, and then I uh, ended up in... Uh, uh, oh, they took, they took us out to Versailles. To, you know, Versailles, yes. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, well, and I was, I, in fact, on VJ Day, I was in Paris. And uh, on, v, uh, on Victory Day, you were in Paris. Yeah. yeah. The victory in Japan, the end of the war altogether. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So he was in Paris to, on leave. I was, I was on went, leave and I happened to be in Paris. Oh. When the party broke out. The party broke out was La Guerre et mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. But when uh, did you land on the beaches in Normandy? Yes, but that, uh, long after D Day. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I was a replacement. They still were yeah. using the beach in Normandy because there was yes. no port yeah. yet. Yeah. 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 So still had to land on a landing craft. On the beach. Said, did you go to Berlin? No, I yeah. ended up in uh, Pisek, Czechoslovakia. Oh, right on the Danube. Mm. And did you or participate? Yeah. Oh, yeah. great day. Yeah. <laughs> well. uh, did you did you participate to the uh, the freedom to to free the uh, concentration camps? His unit did one of the. Uh, um, prisoner war camps. Oh, they did. They did liberate one of the prisoner war camps. Yeah, but no. not the uh, <coughs> not the, the death camps. You no. Know. no. No. Okay. Yeah. Well. No. Well, thank they you. Avoided that. Yeah. Thank you for everything you've done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, where were we here? Uh. Yeah talk about the L4 and L5. Yeah, yeah, we got that. And then Neil Seaton, he's from the UK or USA, L4 owner. 
Did you fly with any armor plate under your seat? Some of the guys put a stove lid, but I didn't. A stove lid? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> off of the steel plate off of the stove. That just adds more weight. That's true. <laughs> what about your flying clothing? How was that? Well, I had the complete set of the leather, uh, sheepskin lines, boots and pants and or the yeah, and jacket. But uh, when we got off at, at uh, Omaha Beach, the uh, my uh, bag was not unloaded, and it eventually got to Paris. I found, I found it there after I got back from the war. And so you didn't get any of that during the war? So. No, they issued me another uh, parka, cloth them. Yeah, cotton down parka or something like that? Or? Yeah, I don't remember. I think it had the uh, down uh, fill in it. it okay, I've seen pictures like, of it. It looked like a down parka. Yeah, you know, I said the other cool. soldiers were pretty jealous of that yeah. because they were still in their summer uniform yeah, uh, the during the bulge. When the colonel went to pin the uh, hair metal on me, he said, I don't want to put a hole in that jacket. I said, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, boots headgear. There's a good question because there's a picture of you with the helmet liner on on VE Day in, in Czechoslovakia that somebody took in the cockpit of the yeah you know, the L4. And never never flew with one of those though. No. So you you had to have a hat that you could put the earphones on. So just the crush cap, basically. Yeah, your, yeah usually do. Just, uh, or, or I did have a, uh, a bill cap with the, that I took the, had the, like a 40 mission crush on it, <laughs> so that you could put the earphones on. A <laughs> 40 mission crush? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure what that means, but I'm sure that's an inside. Yeah, that that was the Air Force. Ah. Idea. And how many missions did you have? It was 100 and 135. 135 missions altogether. Combat missions. Combat missions. Okay. Which is why, and this is, I was curious about this when you had um, a mishap, more or less. In deep snow, because when you, when you were moving from one, the unit was moving from one yeah, place from to Belgium another. Belgium to, to Germany. Okay, Belgium to Germany, and you and Beth took off. And tell me what happened. Well, uh, I lost the other pilot. We were flying above an overcast, and beginning to run low on fuel and so I found a hole in the break in the overcast and went down through it and found a, a strip to land on but it was about a foot or more of snow and and so when the wheels touched it did a flip and end of the story well no, uh, a uh, mission that found me uh, uh, and took me to their aid station. They said I was, if I'd have gone any farther, I'd have been in enemy territory. And uh, so they took me to their aid station. And uh, as, as you know, with an L4, you have that gas tank and that skinned my shin and and I hit my uh, nose on the on the dash and and so it bled profusely. I didn't 
I thought I, I unbuckled my belt and rolled right out of the wing, but when I went back to get my B4 bag, uh, the entire inside of the plane was covered with blood, so obviously I didn't unbuckle it right away, only after I came to. <laughs> oh, yeah. But no Purple Heart for that? No. Because it was not... It wasn't a combat mission. It wasn't a combat mission. It was only in the in between combat missions, and uh, it just seems kind of odd to me. But uh, anyway, but <laughs> um, okay. So so we got through the clothing, the boots. Did you have like heavy boots? Because it's no, kind of cold in that cockpit in you know, Germany. Well, we just wore the the boots with the leather leather top that had two buckles on it. Oh, that's right. You had a buckle boot. It wasn't. Yeah the shoes and leggings like a lot of the guys still had. No, those were the ones that ended up in the Paris. <laughs> ah, yeah. But I never got that. And you were telling me this morning when you were here at Port Sill, you had shoes and leggings at yeah, OCS. Yeah, canvas leggings. We canvas leggings. Brown, brown shoes and canvas leggings. And, uh, had to scrub them every day with a brush to get the salt off that you'd sweat out. <laughs> okay, so um, Paris, uh, Per Anders Johnson from Norway, he said there's a story, a story that they strapped a barrel of beer between the gear legs and flew it out to the troops. What kind of odd, unusual mission do you recall? Well, never did that. <laughs> you didn't you didn't haul beer out to them no they seem to find their own i think from what well, i've been reading one of them was the uh one of my uh observers always carried a carbine with him and uh if you'd see a deer why well, i'd uh swoop down and he'd shoot the deer and then we'd radio our ground crew plus a little coordinates were so that they could go and pick it up and then we could have fresh venison for a while to eat. Ah, so they used basically the same map to call in artillery and use the map coordinates to call in a deer. Yeah. Well, that's where that worked. Well, sure. He did everything with map coordinates. Because didn't you say at one time you ate beans for, because you won't eat beans anymore. Oh, well, you know, when we were going across Germany, we were, you know, we'd go as far as we could every day with the M7. And, uh, right, because they're all self-propelled, so you're moving right. as fast as you can well, stay up with now the, armored. With a with an armored unit like that, the first priority is fuel, and then the second priority is ammo, and then other things fall behind that. So that food, uh, uh, food uh, for instance, as I said, we, we ate beans, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for almost a week. And uh, another thing that you probably don't think about is toilet paper is also part of the supply. And so that's way down the list. And we were <laughs> issued six sheets of slick paper a day and uh that seems that, to rub you the wrong way it did <laughs> <laughs> to this day i i my luxury is 12 sheets of paper every time i go to john's <laughs> okay uh were you ever attacked by enemy fighters and how did you escape well, because you're here, time, so you must have escaped. One time they said that, that uh, there were 11 ME 109 at a certain level and, and direction. And I thought, oh, you guys are nuts. We've never seen that many plan uh, foreign planes together at this time. And, but I was wrong. And uh, one of them peeled off to get me and and I just kept turning inside of him and, and losing altitude until I 
got right on the trees, and he made one pass, fired at me, and went on. That was it. That was the only time I had any uh, enemy, by uh, any aircraft attack. Well, it's kind of a pucker factor when they start firing on a canvas airplane, isn't it? And well, uh, the great thing about the canvas airplane are the bullets just go right through. They they don't explode or or anything. Oh, okay, sure. They just go right through and make a hole, and that's and that usually doesn't affect the flying much. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it was in the wrong spot, right? Right. Um, okay, another question of how many how many hours would an average um, flight mission be? And uh, how many in a month? I mean, I, you still have your flight record, so. Yeah, I didn't check that. Uh, they seem to be like an hour and a half, two hours. Mostly, yeah. And... Um, However, and during the bulge on that day, you were up for six hours, six hours, yeah. which means you went up three times at least, or did you have to refuel yeah. every well, couple hours. Yeah, you also have to take a leak every once in a while too. Well, that's true. Preferably when you're refueling. Yeah, but <laughs> and grab the bike to eat, take off again. Another plate of beans. Uh, I don't think <laughs> at that time we we were not. Sure you weren't rationing down on to on beans. The line. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, let's see where we are here. So and, and okay, and how many missions a month? Basically every day, or basically every day that the weather was decent. And so I remember when not so decent either. <laughs> Or not, yeah. By by today's uh, terms, for these guys that are flying these planes, uh, of course, their planes are a lot more expensive now than they were back when they yeah, sent you another one. That L four only cost a couple thousand dollars. Yeah, about two thousand dollars. Yeah, mm -hmm. and maybe by today's, you know, exchange, it's that's probably at least fifteen thousand or something. I don't know. Well, we're, they're like thirty or forty thousand now. Oh, I'm sure these people could tell you how much they are. And they're not, not cheap, um, especially if they've been totally reconditioned. Uh, okay, so then when when you guys were on the move, though, you were flying every day. Yeah, somebody was. Yeah, we were. Or you traded off a fifth or. Well, I mean, I remember CEO, you said you were flying our, point. Our normal. CEO wanted one of us to be flying point all of the time. Sometimes we just took turns flying point mm -hmm. of the column. And that was after you crossed the Rhine or up until yeah. the Rhine? Or? Well, both. Well, I think after you crossed the Rhine, you were moving pretty fast. That's right. Uh, after after we got across the bridge, and you guys crossed. At, I know the Remagen. You got Remagen, but not. I think the original bridge had fallen down. Oh, before we crossed. Before yes. you guys crossed, yeah, because we across Shores then. told me he was the first one to cross the pon pontoon bridge. Right. Um. And John Shores, he also told me he shot down a. A V1 with a 50 caliber mounted on a <laughs> half track, I think. <laughs> yeah. And it, which, um, so that was there. Ed Morgan was where I first saw my the, the jet plane. Uh huh. And uh, you know, if you've only seen propeller-driven planes. You say, how can that thing fly? Yeah. It was an ME-262 trying to bomb the bridge there in Auburn. They were trying to bomb the original bridge. Right. Okay. So you were there in mm, 
now I forgot where that is because I know you got a little oh paperweight ball for shine ball for shine you have the paperweight with the vineyards above ball for shine little yeah. souvenir you picked up or something yeah somewhere uh huh so you were there for a little while yeah waiting yeah. to cross yeah lots yeah. Of, lots lots of booze to drink there. <laughs> Was that where the the company of uh, um, Rangers uh, no, captured that, was, that airstrip? And no, that was after we had crossed. Mm -hmm. I think that was up by Cologne. Okay. And um, up by Cologne. Okay. I'll have to look at the map and, look at it and see where that where we're talking about. But. Okay, let me get back to another question here. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, the question, what mission do you remember the most? I guess that was probably all day the 17th. 17th yeah. on the Battle of the Bull. Well, we got uh, uh, the only claim to fame was probably uh, getting a, a Panzer column that had between 40 and 50 vehicles destroyed with and there we fired uh, Army 240s. We fired uh, on that day. We is the only time we fired anything but our own unit, and uh, we fired the 155s of the 78th Division because they grounded their planes, and we also uh, fired four. Which I think were the 155 long toms, and then we they gave us the army artillery with, with the 240s to use on that column, of Panther column, and uh, you could hear those uh, 240 shells going through the air, even over the sound of the engine on the LM4. As they make a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh as they're going through the air. Okay, and then where were you in relation to where the guns were? Because that's well, another I, question. I, of I always what? tried to keep the target between me and the guns, which meant I was always flying over enemy territory. And uh, Were you taught to do that at Fort Sill? Was that no, protocol to fly over? No, they, they wanted you to fly alongside, but... Uh, you're you're more likely to get shot down by your own artillery than you are uh, by enemy because they they didn't want to fire on you because they knew that you could put the fire right back on them with bigger stuff. Okay, and that was I'm gonna, I'm just gonna jump up to another question of whether did did you ever carry hand grenades and use those? And I think you told me no. That no, that wouldn't be a good idea. That would not be a good idea. If you're low enough to, to find an enemy, they're close enough to shoot at you too. Yeah. So what? Okay. So this question I have then is what kind? I mean, you, there's not a given altitude you're going to be at, right? No, but, but uh, we probably uh, very seldom got above 500 feet. Above the, above the ground. Yeah, above the ground, whatever it was. Now, and the Arden is kind of hilly. Yeah, well, you have to avoid the trees. <laughs> well, that'd be a good thing, you know, because they don't move out of the way. Um, so, um, okay. Let's see. Tom Petterman from the Czech Republic, which was part of Czechoslovakia back right. at that time, right? Yeah. Uh, can you tell how the last days of the war in Czechoslovakia were? Do you know any places, planes, their unit codes, especially L4s attached attached the 4th Armored Division? You were with 3rd Army at that time? You were with yeah. Patton at that time, 3rd Army? And you were in, you ended up in what, 
but I, I don't even remember my own playing shows, so I don't remember others. Okay. Uh, so, um, we, you don't remember the number on your plane or no. now, how many planes did you have when you were there? Well, you mean, uh, All, I mean, the two flew, L4s, yeah, how many L4s wind. did you go through, uh, when you were with the 62nd Army? Well, I had a new one when I arrived there because the other the pilot I was replacing was a crash and burn. Yeah. And uh, I think, and other than that. So the one, one that flipped in the snowstorm, was yeah, that replaced or did they just they, fix it? The, they, uh, I just got another new plane. You got a new plane for that one. And then I think that's the only two planes that I had during the war. The, you know, the, the guys could repair them pretty good. You get a landing gear or, or a prop and they, and they uh, carried all those spare parts. So They didn't have like a little metal that you could get a, you know, another plane on for everyone you crash or? No. That was for the fighter, fighter pilots to put on there yeah, how many planes they took down, right? Yeah, I said <laughs> if I'd if I'd have got one more plane, I'd have been a German ace. <laughs> okay, um, okay, but the last you do remember Czechoslovakia in the end, as right. far as um, right, we ended up at uh, VE Day, and then in was, Czechoslovakia, we ended up at, at uh, I don't say which town was Chisic. Hissek? Hissek. Hissek. Hissek, which Hissek. is on the uh, Danube River where we met the Russians. They were supposed to stay on their side and we were supposed to stay on our side. How'd that work? Well, one of the Russian units came over and occupied the town on our side and our colonel took his 18 M7s and and three tanks and surrounded the town and went in and told the commander, you be gone at daybreak or I'm going to level this town. And the uh, Russians were gone. They left. They avoided the Cold War. They avoided it. Well, or. Well, it wasn't the Cold extension War. Extension of the. Of the. the <laughs> extension of World War Two. Right? Yeah, okay. That was Patton's idea that, that we should just keep on going. You know? Mm-hmm. Well, and at that time you were assigned to them. You were, what? You were your unit was assigned to the Third Army or yeah, some group right. within the Third Army. Third Army. Because you, as a, as you call it, a bastard unit. The 62nd Armored Field Artillery was not within any division structure, no. or you were no. attached wherever they needed. Well, extra most of, mostly we had a task force of uh, two squadrons of light cavalry. Our artillery battalion, a battery of ACAC, a company of engineers, a battery from uh, uh, Second Ranger Battalion, and I don't remember what, what else, but that was a task force goal. And that's what we bought in from uh, our first entry into Germany until. Uh, the end of the war. Okay, and and that task force was 102nd Recon. Well, that group, was, or yeah, he was a, within well, the 102nd Recon group. Well, but the 102nd Recon group was the 102nd and 38th Cavalry unit. Okay, that was what Dolph was in charge of. But then they attached us to that task force and all these other units so that uh, it was a pretty mobile group um okay then uh let's see how you can tell the last day's war we went through that and you went across and and, and 
And had a few drinks with the Russians, didn't you? Yeah. How'd that end up? Well, uh, they didn't want to let us back across. And uh, they fired on us. Uh, not on us. They fired up in the air when we just went on across anyway. <laughs> well, you know, but we never went back. No, I probably wouldn't go back either. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, you know, about the M1, you guys carried an M1, or one of your observers carried one an M1. One of my observers carried an M1, but none of the others did, and I didn't either. And it was a standard M1, or a, a I don't carbine? Or? Yeah, I think it was just a standard M1. Standard M1. Uh, I don't think he had the grease gun. And then you guys carried a 45, the 1911 model. Right. And, and a shoulder holster. Shoulder holster, okay. Because I saw a picture of a guy getting in to an L4 with the hip mounted holster. Well, if he was an observer, that's what he would have had. Okay. Uh, but the pilot didn't use that because it was, it could well, interfere with the cables or something. Out and, uh, you don't need anything sticking out. Right. Um, okay, here's another question from Bart. Uh, and you know, Bart, I can never pronounce your last name because there's so many darn consonants. <laughs> Simjik. That's, that's as close as I can get. Uh, how do fire mission work in detail? All right, now this is getting a little bit into detail, which is how long ago, 70, some, 72, three years ago. Um, how did you communicate between you and headquarters ba uh, uh, battery? And how was it, you know, fire mission, how was that accomplished through communications? So now you know, you told me, I don't know how they did the rest of it. I spoke to the who? The F3 determined who you were going to fire. Uh, so you determined. spoke to the S3, and he knew where all the gun batteries were, right? And made the decision on who was going to fire, gonna fire, and, and or whether we needed bigger ones, like on that 17th. He made the decision that we fire Army 240s on that column. And well, you your command center must have been opened up to a lot of different. Obviously the units was, yeah. that day because yeah. uh, the colonel said you guys fired about 300 guns. Yeah, but that would that would be that would be the battalion, division, corps, army. Well, that would have been all radio. That would have been all radio from from, from you our, from our unit to the to. Uh, all the others that we fired that day with all been by radio. Now I know a lot of the ground forward observers, uh, they did string wire for that in certain cases. Yeah. On the, yeah our ground observers used the tanks for their uh, observing, you know, at least they were had some armor with them. Mm -hmm. Um, so as far as the communication beyond the S3, it wasn't your job and... No, that's right. He made that decision and then patched it through to whoever is making it. So he, so that would be a question I have, is he patched you through or he, uh... He just passed the... The, the observer's radio communication to the unit that we were going to fire. Okay. Which would have been another S3. Uh-huh. Or G3. And, and at that time you were firing, you were officially firing for the 78th Division. We were a backup for the 78th. That our task force was still our main Support. Okay, but as my understanding, you were 
the 78th Division had priority on fire missions, but you're also firing for the 99th, which was 78th was it, to the east and 99th a little bit to the north. South. 99th was to the south. Yeah. And the second infantry was their reserves, and so um, you were firing for a lot, a fairly wide front. Yeah. And before that, uh, your task force was was defending how many miles of the uh, front? Oh, of, <laughs> well, yeah, our task force. We were replaced by two divisions, 99th and 106th, uh, and then we pulled over north in, in a much smaller area with the two light cavalry squadrons, 38th and 102nd. Hmm. But that's probably. German intelligence that uh, had the, us. That's why the bulge came that way. And uh, 106 said that one of the guys afterwards said I was kidding him about being in the 106. And he said, What do you mean? We were the first full combat division to reach Berlin as prisoners, of course, because they marched them down. Oh, right. They yeah, marching down the main yeah, drag to show good that they had percent of that division went. Yeah. Um, well, all right. So, so we were covering that same ground that the 106 got captured, pretty much. Uh, oh, Bart wanted to know you took them to Frankfurt after the war. You took planes to Frankfurt. Do you have any details of? where you took them and and who received the birds and what happened to the surplus planes i have no idea but uh that was an air force unit that i was assigned to to ferry those planes uh, i don't remember what the air force unit was but the commanding officer was the first lieutenant and so uh, it was pretty loosely run out that, because we had all the <laughs> officers ferrying planes. Oh, and I believe then they were what? Um, they were just sold off to various. I, I have no idea what happened to them after we turned them in. Whether the they just court. burned them or what? Didn't, don't know. It didn't matter. Didn't matter to me. Just your job to get them here. Uh, um, but that's that's where I was flying the C-64. Okay, into Frankfurt. Yeah. But, so you've flown into Frankfurt. Is it the same as the international airport that's there now, or uh, you know? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it all look, would look different now, anyway no matter where you fly. Um, now we're getting, this is a good question, because I mentioned this, I mentioned this yesterday to Gordon, the curator here of the museum, and he does a lot of reading, and he's done some excellent displays here. And I did I mention, if you've never been here, you should come to this, you would have to get a pass to get on base, it's very easy to do, and then you come to the um, artillery museum. Which is for U.S. Army here. There was just a Frenchman here talking to me. Yeah, yeah, there was a Frenchman in here to, to look at it, right? Yeah. So the question is about the colors. There's a lot of discussion about colors on these planes. And um, did the olive drab look rather bright or rather dark? Was it very different to each plane due to fading or repairs? And I'm just going to put in my reply that Gordon gave me was there's when people are trying to to get the exact correct color, you have to understand that you with like for the British, they sent the paint out in a powder form 
And whoever painted it on might have mixed it with diesel. He might have mixed it with gasoline. He might have mixed it with anything, alcohol. To, and so those colors were going to be whatever it came out. And I don't know if that's the same for the planes. Well, uh, as I remember, it was pretty much the, of this thing, which is a dull green. Yeah. It wasn't bright or shiny. Now, this one looks like it's got a, a brighter color on the bottom than it does on the sides. You know, so well, that was a good idea. It's a good idea. <laughs> You know, if you have it more like the clouds from the ground and more like the trees from the air, you see, you're, that's the beginning of camouflage, I guess. Mm -hmm. And we can look at that here because it's, it's actually right above us here, but I don't know how the lighting is and I'm having to use my computer camera, but that's the L4. Um, I'm a little bit curious about on the landing gears. They got rope wrapped around on one side as sort of oh, a no, shock. No, that's the shock cords that are on both sides. So they just have them. They're supposed to be a cover over them. I think they pulled that one back just so you can see that. But that is the shock absorber. That's that the shock is, cord is that's the is shock a cord for your landing sizal yeah. rope. No, for your landing it's gear. It's a rubberized cord. Oh, really? Yeah, it's rubber. There's a whole bunch of rubber bands inside of that. Okay. So it's not just basically you just get a rope and tie it up if you broke no, one. No, 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 no. It has to it's a very good with the landing. So that... Especially the hard landings. Yeah. We <laughs> <laughs> try not to make those. Well, all right, so I had actually, if there's any, I don't even have a clue. I'm going to look at this here. Uh, I didn't put in any chat windows, so I guess we're not going to chat. And that's how that is. That's the way that ends up. And um, gosh, appreciate your time, Dad. Good. And, you know. It's yeah. about time to go to lunch. We missed the Jart uh, yeah, well, hike or, run today that all the other OCS guys did to run to the top of some hill around here that they had, used to have to do in training. And uh, it was a walk today. It was a walk. Yeah, not not a run. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know those Vietnam vets are getting up in age. I have to tell you, they're in their seventies. They're in their seventies. No, I guess that's starting to get older. So, um, all right, great. Thanks again. Okay.